Federalist number 39, The Conformity of the Plan to Republican Principles, by James Madison. The last paper, having included the observations which were meant to introduce a candid survey of the plan of government reported by the convention, we now proceed to the execution of that part of our undertaking. The first question that offers itself is whether the general form and aspect of the government will be strictly Republican. It is evident that no other form would be reconcilable with the genius of the people of America, with the fundamental principles of the revolution, or with that honorable determination which animates every votary of freedom to rest all our political experiments on the capacity of mankind for self-government. If the plan of the convention, therefore, be found to depart from the Republican character, its advocates must ab abandon it as no longer defensible. What, then, are the distinctive characters of the Republican form? Were an answer to this question to be sought, not by recurring to principles, but in the application of the terms of political writers to the constitutions of different states, no satisfactory one would ever be found. Holland, in which no particle of the supreme authority is derived from the people, has passed almost universally under the denomination of a republic. The same title has been bestowed on Venice, where absolute power over the great body of the people is exercised in the most absolute manner by a small body of hereditary nobles. Poland, which is a mixture of aristocracy and of monarchy in their worst forms, has been dignified with the same appellation. The government of England, which has one republican branch only, combined with an hereditary aristocracy and monarchy, has with equal impropriety been frequently placed on the list of republics. These examples, which are nearly as dissimilar to each other as to a genuine republic, show the extreme inaccuracy with which the term has been used in political disquisitions. If we resort for a criterion to the different principles on which different forms of government are established, we may define a republic to be, at least, or at least may bestow that name on, a government which derives all its powers directly or indirectly from the great body of the people, and is administered by persons holding their office during pleasure for a limited period or during good behavior. It is essential to such a government that it be derived from the great body of the society, not from an inconsiderable proportion or a favored class of it. Otherwise, a handful of tyrannical nobles, exercising their oppressions by a delegation of their powers, might aspire to the rank of republicans and claim for their government the honorable title of republic. It is sufficient for such a government that the persons administering it be appointed, either directly or indirectly, by the people, and that they hold their appointments by either the tenures just specified, otherwise every government in the United States, as well as every other popular government that has been or or can be well organized or well executed will be degraded from the Republican character. According to the Constitution of every state in the Union, some or other of the officers of government are appointed indirectly only by the people. According to most of them, the Chief Magistrate himself is so appointed. According to one, this mode of appointment is extended to one of the coordinate branches of the legislature. According to all the Constitutions also, the tenure of the highest offices is extended to a definite period. In many instances, both within the legislative and the judicial the legislative and executive departments to a period of years. According to the provisions of most of the constitutions, again, as well as according to the most respectable and received opinions on the subject, the members of the Judiciary Department are to retain their offices by the firm tenure of good behavior. Comparing the constitution plan by the convention with the standard here fixed, we have perceived at once that it is, in the most rigid sense, conformable to it. The House of Representatives, like that one branch of at least all of the state, like that one branch at least of all the state legislatures is elected immediately by the great body of the people. The Senate, like the present Congress and the Senate of Maryland, derives its appointment indirectly from the people. The president is indirectly derived from the choice of the people, according to the example in most of the states. Even the judges, with other officers of the Union, will, uh, as in the several states, be the choice, the remote choice of the people themselves. The duration of the appointments is equally conformable to the Republican standard and to the model of state constitutions. As representatives is periodically elective, as in all the states, for a period of two years, as in the state of South Carolina. The Senate is elective for the period of six years, which is about one year more than the period of the Senate of Maryland, and but two more than of the Senates of New York and Virginia. The president is to continue in office for the period of four years, as in New York, in Delaware, the chief magistrate is elected for three years, and in South Carolina, for two years. In the other states, the election is annual. In several of the states, however, no explicit provision is made for the impeachment of the chief magistrate. In Delaware and Virginia, he is not impeachable until out of office. The President of the United States is impeachable at any time during his continuance in office.
The tenure by which the judges are to hold their places is, as it unquestionably ought to be, that of good behavior. The tenure of the ministerial offices generally will be subject of legal regulation conformably to the reason of the case and the example of the state constitutions. Could any further proof be required of the Republican complexion of this system, the most decisive one might be found in its absolute prohibition of titles of nobility, both under the federal and state governments, and in its express guarantee of the Republican form to each of the latter. But it was not sufficient, say the adversaries of the proposed Constitution, for the Convention to adhere to the Republican form, that with equal care to preserve the federal form, which regards the Union as a confederacy of sovereign states, instead of which they have formed a national government, which regards the Union as a consolidation of the states. And is asked by what authority this bold and radical innovation was undertaken. The handle which has been made of this objection requires that it should be examined with some precision. Without inquiring into the accuracy of the distinction on which the objection is founded, it will be necessary to a just estimate of its force. First, to ascertain the real character of the government in question. Secondly, to inquire how far the convention were authorized to propose such a government. And thirdly, how far the duty they owed to their country could supply any defect of regular authority. First, in order to ascertain the real character of the government, it may be considered in relation to the foundation on which it is to be established, to the sources from which its ordinary powers are to be drawn, to the operation of those powers, to the extent of them, to the authority by which future changes in government are to be introduced. On examining the first relation, it appears, on one hand, that the Constitution is to be founded on the assent and ratification of the people of America given by deputies elected for their special purpose. On the other, this assent and ratification is to be given by the people, not as individuals composing one entire nation, but as composing the, dis the distinct and independent states to which they respectively belong. It is to be the assent and ratification of the several states derived from the supreme authority in each state, the authority of the people themselves. The act, therefore, establishing the Constitution will not be a national, but a federal act. That it will be a federal and not a national act, as these terms are understood by the objectors, the act of the people as forming so many independent states, not as forming one aggregate nation, is obvious from this single consideration, that it is to result neither from the decision of a majority of the people of the Union, nor from a majority of the states. It must result from the unanimous assent of the several states that are parties to it, differing no, no otherwise from their ordinary assent than it, in its being expressed not by the legislative authority, but by that of the people themselves. Were the people regarded in this transaction as forming one nation, the will of the majority of the whole people of the United States would bind the minority in the same manner as the majority in each state must bind the minority. And the will of the majority must be determined either by a comparison of the individual votes or by considering the will of the majority of the states as evidence of the will of the majority of the people of the United States. Neither of these rules has been adopted. Each state in ratifying the Constitution is considered as a sovereign body independent of all others and only to be bound by its own voluntary act. In this relation, then, the new Constitution will, if established, be a federal and not a national Constitution. The next relation is to the sources from which the ordinary powers of government are to be derived. The House of Representatives will derive its power from the people of America, and the people will be represented in the same proportion and on the same principle as they are in the legislature of a particular state. So far, as the government is national, so far the government is national and not federal. The Senate on the other hand, will derive its powers from the states as political and co-equal societies, and these will be represented on the principle of equality in the Senate as they now are in the existing Congress. So far, the government is federal, not national. The executive power will be derived from a very compound source. The immediate election of the president is to be made by the states and their political characters. The votes allotted to them are in a compound ratio, which considers them partly as distinct and co-equal societies, partly as unequal members of the same society. The eventual election, again, is to be made by that branch of the legislature which consists of the national representatives. But in this particular act, they are to be thrown into the form of individual delegations from so many distinct and co-equal bodies politic. From this aspect, the government it appears to be of a mixed character, presenting at least as many federal as national features. The difference between a federal and national government as it relates to the operation of the government is by the adversaries of the plan of the convention supposed to consist in this, that of the former, that in the former the powers operate on their political bodies composing the confederacy in their political capacities, in the latter on the individual citizens composing the nation in their individual capacities. On trying the constitution by this criterion, it falls under the national, not the federal character, though perhaps not so completely as it has been understood. 
in several cases, and particularly in the trial of controversies to which states may be parties, they must be viewed and proceeded against in their collective and political capacities only. But the operation of the government on the people in their individual capacities, in its ordinary and most essential proceedings, will, in the sense of its opponents, on the whole designate it in this relation a national government. Or if the government be national with regard to the operation of its powers, it changes its aspect again when we contemplate in it in relation to the extent of its powers. The idea of a national government involves in it not only an authority over the individual citizens, but an indefinite supremacy over all persons and things so far as they are objects of lawful government. Among a people consolidated into one nation, this supremacy is completely vested in the national legislature. Among communities united for particular purposes, it is vested partly in the general and partly in the municipal legislatures. In the former case, all local authorities are subordinate to the Supreme and may be controlled, directed, or abolished by it at pleasure. In the latter, the local or municipal authorities form distinct and independent portions of the supremacy, no more subject when their respective spheres to the general authority uh, than the general authority is subject to them within its own sphere. In this, in this relation, then, the proposed government cannot be deemed a national one since its jurisdiction extends to certain enumerated objects only and leaves to the several states a residuary and inviolable sovereignty over all other objects. It is true that in controversies relating to the boundary between the two jurisdictions, the tribunal which is ultimately to decide, the, decide is to be established under the general government. But this does not change the principle of the case. A decision is to be impartially made according to the rules of the Constitution. And all the usual and most effectual precautions are taken to secure this impartiality. Some such tribunal is clearly essential to prevent an appeal to the sword and a dissolution of the compact, and that it ought to be established under the general rather than under the local governments, or, to speak more properly, that it could be safely established under the first alone and is a position not likely to be combated. We try the Constitution by its last by its last relation to the authority by which amendments are to be made, we find it neither wholly national nor wholly federal. Where wholly national, the supreme and ultimate authority would reside in the majority of the people of the Union. And this authority would be competent at all times, like that of a, like that of a majority of every national society, to alter or abolish its established government. Where wholly federal, on the other hand, the concurrence of each state in the Union would be essential to every alteration that would be binding on all. The mode provided by the plan of the convention is not founded on either of these principles, requiring more than a majority, and particularly in computing the proportion by states, not by citizens, departs from the national advances towards a federal character, and rendering the concurrence of less than the whole number of states sufficient. It loses again the federal and partakes of the national character. The proposed constitution, therefore, even when tested by the rules laid down by its antagonist, is in strictness neither a national nor a federal constitution, but a composition of both. In its foundation, it is federal, not national. In the sources from which the ordinary powers of government are drawn, it is partly federal and partly national. In the operation of these powers, it is national, not federal. In the extent of them, again, it is federal, not national. And finally, in the authoritative mode of introducing amendments, it is neither wholly federal nor wholly national. Publius.